we're going to record and I got to let Gabe screen share. Do your thing. Gabe. So Gabe, do his all thing. the things. I got all my things done. Hi, everybody. Another week. Hi. Another week of good recommendations. I read some oh, yeah. really, really good books this week. Um, some of them aren't out though yet. So I will, um, we'll do a little pre-order thing. Um, but it was, it was a good reading week for me. Hope it was for everybody else out there. So um, yeah. don't really have, I'll announce some events at the end and I'll chat about a couple books in between two. Um, nothing really else going on. Warwick's still same old thing going on at Warwick's. Got a man in the background. Don't worry about your dog barking, Tom. We got, <laughs> or unless you're, unless you're barking. <laughs> They've stopped for the moment. There you go. So um, cheers. Andrea's got a shaved ice with maybe a little bit extra something, something in there. Steve's got something going on. Look, everybody's got a little I, something. I want what everybody else is having. I think I do too. All right. Let's get to some wrecks. Um, it's going to go Gabe, Steve, Tom, Andrea. Hold on. I got to see how it's going to go. I think I'm... Um... No, I think I came in a little bit before Tom. Yeah, you did come in before Tom. So it's going to go um, Gabe, Steve, Andrea, Tom. So with that, um, Gabe, kick us off. I will kick it off. I may have to do my things so I could do my thing. So the first book I'm going to talk about is a debut novel from a uh, American poet, Honoré Fanon Jeffers. Uh, the Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. This is a big 800 page epic novel of uh, family lineage, the story of modern African-American family combined with historical uh, and a modern story. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things, again, you know, uh, I say this all the time and it's not just because I don't have anything to say. But, uh, you know, you've, we've read a lot of these books in the past. We all have. Um, and some stand out, you know, some really stand out. And this is one of those books that uh, really stands out. The jacket is amazing. It was picked uh, by the Oprah Book Club. We were actually going to publish this a little earlier in the year. Uh, but uh, the Oprah Book Club uh, people really loved this book and I chose it. Um, so uh, we delayed publication a little bit on it. And uh, I think it says a lot. Um, for uh, Honoré that uh, it's getting that sort of attention. It's also, uh, if you'll bear with me, I could go on and describe the story, um, but it is, it's one of those epic family dramas that's just beautifully written. The opening, uh, the opening pages of this, just real lyrical, beautiful writing. And she slips it and out into the narrative and then these lovely passages that she infuses the book with, uh, which make it just this really terrific literary read. A lot of stuff from book clubs to digest here because it's history, social history, um, it's family, it's domestic drama. There's so much in this book. Um, but just to give you a quick idea, it was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize. It was an Indie Next pick, New York Times book everyone will be, will be talking about, People's Five Best Book of the Summer, Good Morning America, 15 Summer Book Club Picks, In Essence, Best Book of the Summer, a Time Magazine, 11 Best Books of the a Month, uh, Washington Post, 10 Best Books of the Month, CNN Best Book, Goodreads, Book Page, USA Today, Literary Book Club, Book Club Pick, Biblio Lifestyle's Most Anticipated Literary Book of the Summer, a Deep South Best Book of the Summer, winner of the Audiophile Earphones Award. And I'm going to stop because it's just, wow. regardless of how small some of these things that you've never heard of, uh, there's, you know, USA Today, the Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, Time Magazine. Uh, so all the heavy hitters are there and it's deep. And it's across the board from the book world, the literary book world, to the commercial book world, to you know lifestyle uh, pages. So it's getting uh, read the first on your blog. This was actually out last week. I didn't make it last week because I was on vacation. Uh, but this is one of those books I've been wanting to talk about, and it looks beautiful on your coffee table, on your bookshelf. Uh, I'm, we're, we're really excited about, uh, obviously, uh, about this book. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing. That cover is amazing. Amazing, amazing cover. Looking book. Yeah, we really. Oh, that's gorgeous. We thought yeah. we had a really special book, and they just really wanted to yeah. do it justice all, yeah. all the way across the board. And it's really paid off. 
Yeah, you nailed that comment. And the, and the quote from Jackie Woodson is amazing too. I love, I yeah. adore her. So when she says this is a great American novel, I believe her. I really was like hard pressed to find, you know, which one did I use to start book, uh, book list, the Kirkus, the PW. There's so many great quotes uh, for this from authors and reviewers across the board. So, And I want to tell people too, because some people like shy away from the big fat books. Don't shy away from, I love a good big fat book. It's like, you know, some people say, oh, you know, and some that are big need to be edited, but sometimes right. it's like when it's a good meaty book and it's yeah. well done, it's, yeah. oh, there's nothing I was better. Just, I was just looking at, I was thinking, I, you know, I want to read a couple of books, The Name of the Rose, I want to reread that. And I want to, and I at some point want to reread uh, Bug Murtry's Lonesome Love. And I pulled out my Lonesome Dove and it's about 140 oh, yeah. pages. And it, I, it could have been twice as long and I would have been with it. Exactly. So uh, do not shy away from the big fat meaty bugs. Okay, Beth is on here and I'm going to interrupt our little um, thing here for a minute because her question is, um, she's curious and if we don't mind sharing, um, how many books do we all read in a week? And so um, I typically will read one minimally, three max is about per week what I what I and I mean that's start to finish I do start something like I rarely will toss it away um it's got to be really bad writing I pretty much will finish it to the bitter end because then I could say it was crap or not. <laughs> <laughs> proudly you can say it I can proudly say <laughs> I finished it and didn't like it but no that's okay what about you guys I mean you all probably don't finish books to a completion all the time do you depends I mean, not all the time reading. When you're reading for work, I think uh, you read, we read a lot of sections because sometimes manuscripts aren't finished and a lot of the nonfiction, you just want to get an idea of the flavor. And uh, But, you know, there's certain novels, I think all of our, what we call make novels, uh, get read pretty well by everybody. Right. So those those little gems that you find, those are the things that I, re I read because the big guys don't necessarily read, need my help and I'll read them at my leisure right. on the beach or something. Or, I'll, you know, I know who I'm looking forward to, but books like this, uh, you know, every season we all have a handful of books that we read all the way through because they're that they're that good. It's really embarrassing. I used to read a lot more of other people's books, uh, but we have so many good books at Harvard. You know, right. and I'm Simon and Simon and Penguin and uh, Random same thing. There's so many good books. What about you, yeah. Thomas, Steve? What are you guys? Where are you guys at? I guess I I'm I'm not the fastest reader, so it's for me it's usually a book a week to 10 days, somewhere in there is what I, I read. And I do read a lot of little pieces of other things, especially as, as we're getting ready, we have our sales conference three times a year where the all the reps in the country get to meet with the editors and mm. the publishers. And you gotta do a lot of prep for that. And in prepping for that, you end up reading quite a few excerpts of things, you know, a, a yeah. chapter or, or, or two, that sort of thing. How about you, Tom? And I'm the, I'm the same way, but not a fast reader. So I would hope I average a book a week, but this week I might not have finished the book, but I'm reading a couple of other things at the same time. So by next week, I might have finished that one book and moved on to another book. Yeah. So um, something like that. But And uh, Andrea, what about you? Get some pieces too. Yeah. I used to read more when, I I started doing this 23 years ago and when I first started I would read like three books a week probably just because I felt like I needed to read more of the early manuscripts just to be prepared but um, as uh, all of my other fellow reps here were saying and um, as as uh, Gabe said you got to get a flavor for the for the nonfiction. And that doesn't take, you don't have to finish that, but for some of the books that, you know, you want to make it a breakout title, the publisher, one of your, you know, important publishers wants you to, you know, break this book out. You, you've got to, you got to read it, yeah. you know, yeah. um, you got to know, you got to know what, what you speak. Yeah. I don't read as many um, books from other publishers during my season. I do that on vacation. Although I just finished, I downloaded um, an e-manuscript for The Anomaly. Okay, we talked about press. it in the green room. We just room. talked about it. We just oh, talked okay. about oh. it in the green room. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Okay, oh my cool. God. Yeah, I'm yeah, going to talk about that, that one. That but, is something else. Right? 
Okay. Yeah. Just saying. Um, but this Just is something saying. that well, I even want to know. Go ahead, Tom. I, I also, speaking of read, I don't get to read other publishers' books as much as I want to, but I try to listen to books on audio from other publishers. Okay, so that's the way go. I can try to experience kind more, of squeeze I in. always want to read more. There's many books I want to read that I can't yeah. get to. Here's a question, and I know we're getting completely off topic, and today's going to go way longer than everybody, so sorry about that, who, are, who you all are watching, but I'm fascinated by this, too. And just give me real quick, in a season, so a season, you each of you, I think, have like three seasons a year, is that correct? Um, yes. Yeah. How many titles in each season? Gabe, just real quick, how many, average? Of me, about yeah. 800. 800? Yeah, 850. Steve? Uh, a little over 800, 830 on this the list I'm learning or preparing now. The spring list. I think a little bit less between seven and 800 probably. And Andrea? I have 2,000. Oh <laughs> we knew I you have would two, win, and that's it. And that's in like a four month period, correct? So we have three seasons yeah. a year. So right. think about that, everybody. Think about that. Anyway, it's, totally it, you know, it's, it's rough sometimes, about, but. Think about the percentage of books we're actually able to finish right. out of that number of books. Right. And you know, this is just four fun. publishers here. We still have a lot of other publishers that aren't here, like Simon and Schuster and Hachette and Macmillan. And so there's a lot of books that get published. Oh, we digress. Steve, take us away <laughs> with our next selection. But that's, I mean, I think people are fascinated by it. No, me. that is it fascinating. Is, yeah. I, you know, maybe at the end of the year, you know, like after the holidays, we can actually talk a little bit about that and yeah. like explain what we do a little bit. Cause I do think that, I do think people are interested to know. Yeah. And to know that there's like, see, cause I don't think that people understand that there's like seasons of books, kind of like there's seasons of clothes, you know, there's like, they come out in like chunks at a time. Yeah. So anyways, Steve, take us away. All right. Well, um, my first book is Billie Jean King's All In that came out about a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks. And, and here's one of those books where uh, it's not a, a autobiography. I read the first couple chapters, was really good, wanted to get the flavor. And then I moved on to some of those make books that Gabe was talking about. Um, and this afternoon, because I wanted to talk about this book. So I, I wanted to have more to talk about because she's an incredible, just an incredible person. And I, I, watched on YouTube, the LA Times, she was their pick for this month mm -hmm. for the LA Times book club. And she did an interview that I, I, I watched this afternoon and she's just, the things that she's done in her life. I mean, she really um, brought women into being paid for playing tennis. And that was the beginning of women being paid for you know, all professional sports and Title IX and the difference that make. And this is just, I think her, what she accomplished on the tennis court is incredible what she did. And the whole Bobby Riggs thing is just amazing. And her talking about it is always fascinating. But her, her continued fight for uh, equal pay uh, and the rights of women in sports goes on. She's doing it like, all, she's still doing it. And she's just this incredible positive person who has accomplished so much and I just have so much respect for her. Yeah. Oh, got Steve frozen a little bit. She's, um, I will just say, let me just say while Steve is frozen that, um, <laughs> She's amazing, and she is the reason why I was able to play baseball when I was a kid with the boys, because I would not have been allowed to play baseball, and there was no softball leagues, Right. so I played with, like, 12-year-old boys when I was nine um, because of Billie Jean King, and yeah. she's amazing. I was just listening to, um, funnily enough, I was listening to an interview with her on Mark Maron's podcast this today before I got on here with everybody. And she says that the Bobby Riggs match, it comes up. She has had a discussion about that. Somebody mentions it to her every day oh. since then. Wow. Every day. Wow. Which is insane. Yeah. That that yeah. had such a cultural impact, you know? Yeah. But in, so, in, a, in a way, I, when, I, when I, before the book and all the interviews, I, when I heard, thought of Billie Jean King, unfortunately, I also thought of Bobby Riggs. 
but her life is so much more than that, which I kind of knew, but the book and the inter- I heard her on Fresh Air, incredible interview. Yeah. She's such a generous yeah. uh, person. That's the thing too, yeah, that it amazing. must be, it must be kind of annoying that that's what you're defined by a little bit that like that. Cause Bobby, who gives a rat's well, ass about Bobby Riggs? Never, I'm sorry. Yeah. We would never, <laughs> we would never even know Bobby Riggs name were it not no. for. for yeah, no, exactly. And but she said, and that's why it. I had to win. But yeah. she said, and that's why I had to win that's because right. otherwise they wouldn't have taken everything else that I was doing seriously. So she knew how high the stakes were. Yeah. I mean, not to, I mean, Bobby, you know. if you're watching, Bobby, if you're watching, I didn't mean to <laughs> offend you in any way. Sorry about that. <laughs> Anyways. Okay. I believe he, I believe he has left here. He's left the building. He has, he's left. <laughs> oh, he's left. The, he's actually, he's, okay. He's in the anomaly. He's less, he's left the Astrodome. <laughs> he's in the anomaly, Andrea. <laughs> yes. He's in the anomaly. <laughs> Okay, go, Andrew, go. <laughs> okay, um, I want to talk about this book today, Triple Cross. This is from um, Atlantic Monthly Press, the sister to our literary press, Grove. And this is by Tom Bradby. It's a hardcover at $27. And this is the um, third in um, a series of espionage thrillers Um starring um, former M16 agent Kate Henderson, who's back on the quest uh, to unmask a Russian agent in the British government. And um, the thing that I love about the Kate Henderson novels is that it subverts the spy thriller genre paradigm, um, uh, the gender paradigm Mm. as Mm. well, not just the genre paradigm, but the gender paradigm in um, a delightful way she's definitely a badass but she's also um and and a steely and savvy operator but she's also um vulnerable she can be vulnerable and um sensitive and you know has a family so she can do both of those things which i really like so she does not like you know completely cut off her uh soft side to be a badass so that's really interesting it's um it's written very well. Um, the author is a um, journalist, and so there's a lot of um, sort of delicious jabs at um, the government, the British government, and M16 because he knows all those people, right? Um, and um, here's some here's some quotes. Let me get, pull this up on my screen here. Um, the character of Kate is just terrific. She's honest, brave, and whip smart first and foremost. Uh, Kate, and she wants to do the right thing, but in the murky world of 21st century espionage, espionage, it's not always clear what that is. If any of you are missing the Cold War espionage, espionage novels of the 70s and 80s, this series is for you. Um, so that's great. And then, um, and then uh, she got a star review, a star review from Bookless, and, and uh, they say, Brad me, Master Bradby, the author masterfully combines textured psychological drama with a rip roaring plot that that boasts several dizzying switchbacks along the way to a genuinely shocking conclusion and that's pretty much that could be applied to any of the three of these but um definitely this one um it starts out like he hits the ground running and um in the in the opening scenes basically um Kate has to protect her family as they're on vacation. So um, I just think that it's a great uh, initial setup in the first pages, uh, first few pages, and um, it just does not stop. It's gripping throughout. So I hope you guys will pick this up. There's a stack at Warwick's, Triple Cross. I don't know if you can see that, uh, by Tom Bradby, $27 uh, hardcover. And that is officially out September 7th, but um, there's no hard and fast street date. So it's on the shelves now. And that's where I think we're coming up to Labor Day weekend, which is a great time to read those like fast thriller kind of books. So Mm -hmm. there's never too many of those. So love it. No, no. And I have another one too, just because of that for my next pick. So see, there we go. Perfect timing. All right, Tom, what do you got for us? All right. So um, I, this is just, this is just a real crowd pleaser. It's out tomorrow. It's a trade paperback original, The Last Chance Library. So from just from the cover, you know, like there's a lot to love about this book. If you love librarians, if you love books about books, 
it's all here. So um, it's really a lot of fun. June Jones is a lonely librarian in a small English village. She's just turned 30. She's kept to herself. She's uh, shy. She's not, doesn't want to be a public person. But then the government decides they're going to defund her library. And she is drawn out into the fight to save the library. Um, and with her are, you know, a, just a delightful bunch of characters, eccentrics. Uh, all the locals come out to save what is really the heart of their community, the library. Um, and so, and of course, with that, June, you know, she opens up herself and her heart. Um, so it's just really, just a really fun read. Um, personal growth, um, personal strength, um, family, friends, and there is even a love story. So I just think it's an easy book to pick up right at this time of year. Um, especially because it's it's a it's coming out in paperback first, only in paper. I mean, hardcover for libraries. Um, so if you love books like books, the other books we published, Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. There's been definitely elements of that here. The Bookish Life of Nina Hill, and especially the Authenticity Project, which we published a year or two ago. Um, and there's a great quote from the author of the Authenticity Project: "A wonderfully warm and uplifting story of kindness, community, and love." that made me laugh, cry, cheer, and want to champion all of our fabulous libraries. So what could be better? The Last Chance Library. That was perfect. Sounds like a perfect Warwick's book. <laughs> totally. And yeah. I love, we don't do a lot of trade paper originals like this. This could easily be a hardcover, but it's nice to have it in paper, $16 out tomorrow. Yeah, and that's the thing too that I think that people need to realize that don't discount paperback originals. Because Absolutely. there's sometimes people are like, oh, if it was it? It's like, no, there's sometimes where it's just as good, if not better, as a hardcover book. It just is, there's different things that are going on. Um, totally. Really, there's a lot of good paperback originals out there. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about, oh, what should I talk about first? I don't know. Um, I guess I'll talk about the Peter Heller event. So um, we're hosting Peter, like, where, where am I? I don't even know where I'm at. My technology skills are lacking today. Um, here we go, there we go. So we're hosting Peter Heller on Wednesday, September 1st at 4 p.m. for his new book out called The Guide. I think it came out last week. Am I correct on that, Steve? Okay, came out last week. Um, for those of you that, if you're a Warwick's customer, then you know that um, one of our favorites is, um, and I'm going to stop sharing here because I like seeing all of you guys versus seeing me. Oh my God, I'm losing it. The dog stars. The, do the dog, dog stars. stars. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know oh. what I did here. Um, I've lost control of my screen. There we go. Now I'm back. Okay, um, dog stars. So if you're, because we were fans of dog stars for a minute. So Peter Heller, we actually hosted like right before the shutdown last year. And so it was, I think for the river maybe was the book that was out last year. Um, yeah, that's the prequel to this one. Yeah. Okay, you don't need to have read that one to read this one. This one starts, at least in my opinion, it's just that great, it, he talks about Colorado and fly fishing and just this really, I mean, he writes sort of like a, um, a river runs through it kind of, you just have this feeling of just being out in nature and this is wonderful writing, but then he always puts in, like the dog stars very much po post-apocalyptic. This one has a little bit of future foreshadowing of a you know, the pandemic and things that are happening, but it's just fantastic. So if you aren't doing anything on Wednesday, please come join us. Um, we're going to have it here. You can also register to be in the webinar too. Peter's wonderful. So I can't wait to um, see the interview with Jennifer Thompson. Come in and join us and um, pick up the guide. It's so good. So love it. Okay, Gabe. I, lo I love, I love Peter Heller. So, I'm so, so good. He's so good. He's really good. Love him. This is, this is sitting around the house right now. Well, there you go. Okay, so we got a little bit of love on him. Ready to go. So my second book is The Secret History of Food. Yum. And this is one of those books that's just a really fun entertainment, um, fun facts about food. Um, the whole tomato, is it fruit, is it vegetable debate is in here. Um, 
the eating habits of the pilgrims are in here. They were really reluctant to, to try native foods. They went hungry a lot in spite of like living in this bounty that is America. So he's got some really fun stories about food and the origins of food and how you're affected by food. Apparently uh, the foods your parents like are, and eat a lot of like while your mom's pregnant, you're gonna get, it's gonna be part of your diet as well. It's sort of transferred in. Uh, they've done those kind of experiments. Um, it's a book about, uh, you know, little anecdotes uh, that are just fun to, uh, you know, piece, uh, fun little pieces of history to read. Like I said, it's all about food and how it, uh, where it comes from, how it affects you. Uh, it sort of starts off with that quote, uh, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are or what you are. Um, so, you know, he plays on the whole new farming, local farming, farm to table stuff. He also pokes fun at, you know, I just got my, like the quote here, your morning cup of joe came from Hawaii last month. And, uh, you know, and your, and your manuka honey from Israel, and, uh, all these things that he's making fun of and fads and food fads. So it's just a whole uh, melange of food stories and food history, basically. And uh, fun facts that you, that makes little tidbits. It's the kind of book you pick up, you put down, pick up, you put down. Uh, and it's just fun to have around. Good little trim size, it's a nice little gift size. Um, you know, food writing is a lot of fun. I think uh, I didn't realize how much I enjoyed writing it's about food till I was older. Uh, and, uh, and food historians are fascinating. We were somewhere on a vacation in the UK and there's a, their, their PBS is some guy talking about apples and local apples. And we just like a whole hour hearing about apples, you know. So uh, this is for that audience, people who, yeah. who, who like stories about food and food history. So. But it's true. I mean, I mean, think about Anthony Bourdain. I mean, who tells a better right. food story than Anthony? But it's just like there is a fascination with it, with all of the food. I got caught up on watching, <coughs> I think it was a British thing about uh, the chocolate factories that are there and then sat for an hour and watched how they made like Kit Kats or something. I mean, it's just... <laughs> British Kit Kats. <laughs> yeah, British Kit Kats. And it's like, they have this I would giant, watch that. oh my God, this thing was on the Smithsonian Channel. It was fascinating. It was this like giant warehouse of like 7 million Kit Kats. It was just like a day goes through it. I don't know, it's insane. But I think that there is a fascination with um, food and, and the history and where it's from and stuff. So cool book. I was wondering what the trim size was. I'm glad you said, because I wasn't sure if it was like coffee table size, but it's more no, of like it's a, a little, small. Gift, little gifty size book, which is perfect. Okay, I've lost track of who's next. I think it's Steve. Yes, it's me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I lost track of myself there. I, I've yeah, lost we, my internet. We were waiting. Connection. <laughs> we finished, very, we finished. very dramatic, very dramatic exit, Steve. You were yeah. just like... Uh, it could happen. It could happen again. So. And Andrew was really good and filled in, and I just like stuck my foot in my mouth. So it was a perfect ending for you. So oh, okay, <laughs> well, be ready for it. It might happen again. Um, my next one is a, this gorgeous memoir called "Beautiful Country" uh, by Quan Julie Wang. Um, this comes out next week. Uh, it's a debut. She is an incredible writer, and this is an incredible story. It's already getting major uh, love from major uh, reviewers, writers, and it's an Indie Next pick. And her story is uh, in, in 1994, she was a seven-year-old, um, and she had just flown from China to New York, to New York City, where she and her parents would live undocumented in extreme poverty for the next five years. And America in Chinese is, uh, they say Mei Gao. I'm probably totally butchered that, but what it, it, it translates to beautiful country. So they've come to the beautiful country and yet for them, everything is upside down. Her, her, her parents in China were professors, you know, and the, they, they left because of their political affiliations and how to leave the country. But in America, the mother they're working in sweatshops and, and she was very popular when she was a girl at her school. And now she's like treated very poorly by the other kids. But she slowly is able to um, 
well, not slowly, she very quickly learns English. She, um, and a lot of it is from uh, watching TV and especially reading books. Uh, the Babysitter's Club, the Babysitter's Club plays a key role in her learning how to speak English. But one of the great things about this book is, is just how she makes you feel like in the moment there with her. And there's this incredible scene where she talks about She's on the, the subway and she's sure, or she becomes convinced that she's being followed by a man. And she gets off one subway and goes to another and he gets on that one. And eventually he, he disappears from view, but that feeling never, she, she never gets rid of that feeling of any moment they could be caught and thrown out of the country. And so it's really, really a, a portrait of, of what any undocumented person in this country feels. So um, anyway, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous memoir. Her writing's in just beautiful. It's Beautiful Country by Juan Julie Wang. Yeah, no, and it's getting a real, it's really getting really good review. Is it out tomorrow or is it already um, out? So, yeah, it comes out, no, uh, the 7th, next week. Next week, okay, okay. Um, but it's getting a lot of good pre buy. I mean, it's hearing a lot about that one. So can't wait, can't wait for that one. Okay, uh, Andrea, you are next. Thanks, Julie. Um, <clears throat> I wanna talk, uh, I have another thriller for you because it is sort of the last hurrah um, coming up this next weekend. Um, this is The Double Mother by um, Michelle Busi. Um, and this is in translation, um, at $18 trade paperback from World Noir, which is the uh, thriller imprint from Europa, our great literary um, lit in translation publisher that, uh, that I represent. And this is um, just an ingenious thriller from the number two most popular writer in France. Um, and it, it all hinges upon um, a four-year-old boy who um, claims that his mother is not his real mother and he's having recurring nightmares that he's been handed over to perfect strangers. Nobody believes him um, until a school psychologist starts to um, think that the story kind of makes sense. And, um, and she then uh, contacts an investigator and um, the amazing story unfolds. It's really great. It's, um, it's just an amazing work of deception that really is a deep dive into the psyche of a child and you know, cruel games of deception and manipulation, manipulation, eh, manipulation of a person's memory. Um, and Busi is really like a master of red herrings and tangled plots. Um, he plays with illusions and um, like multi-level level subterfuge. So this is just really great. It's gonna keep you on your toes. The writing's great. The translation's wonderful as always with Europa and World Noir. And so that's The Double Mother. And um, that is out now. That's on the shelves at uh, at Warwick's, and it's eighteen dollars trade paper for your beach reading. Okay, love it. Love a good twisty. Yeah, and Europa yeah, it's is a good one. Yeah, and Europa is fantastic. Europa is the best. Yeah, they really are. They what they do, they do really well. Um, they they do. Yep. Yeah, they have a good lineup. They really do. Okay, Tom, what do you got? All right. So my next book is another, so we're on a roll here with trade paperback originals. Um, the Heart Principle by Helen Wang. Um, she's the author of the Kiss, first the Kiss Quotient. Uh, the next book was The Bride Test. And now there's The Heart Principle. And this has been kind of a long time coming, longer than normal for her, um, because it was not an easy book for her to write. And actually like she and Jasmine Guillory, kind of created, they helped to create, there's a, there's a renaissance in romance, in the rom world of romance right now. So many more diverse voices are being heard from um, like never before. And Jasmine Guillory and Helen Wang are really two of the reasons why. 
In Helen's case, um, in 2016, she was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, which I think was previously called Asperger syndrome. And her experience on the spectrum inform informs all of her books, all of her work, but especially that first book. Um, and it was the first time some, a, a, you know, a neurodiverse uh, romance had been published. So she really, you know, and, and it became a mega bestseller. Um, the new book's a little bit different. She calls it a half memoir, the, and she says it's the most me book that I've ever written. And um, she's dealing with, it's still a romance, but she's dealing with weightier issues like caretaking and grief. But um, it'll satisfy her fans and, and I think bring new ones to her. It's set in this, uh, all of her books are set in the same kind of universe. Some characters cross over from one book to another, but you don't need to read them in any particular order. Um, Reviews are great. Fans, early reviews are incredible. Um, all the Goodreads reviews from fans are, are really great. Um, the latest, the, there's a review today that calls it, it says the heart principle is riveting the whole way through, exploring a complex range of subjects in unique and interesting ways. Anna and Quan are an exciting dynamic pair. Their chemistry palpable as they fall deeper and deeper in love. And best of all, she's San Diego's own author. She thing. lives in San Diego with her with her husband and two, in her bio, it always says, lives in San Diego with her husband, two kids and pet fish. So really excited that tomorrow, um, the Heart Principal will be on sale in trade paperback. Fantastic, yeah, no, she's a, she's a local favorite down here. Um, so right. That's kind of, we have a little claim to fame on her a little bit, so love it. Yes, so it'll be, and I, as I said, it took, like an extra year for her to write. She put a lot into this book, so yeah. really yeah. nice. Hey, okay, I'm gonna try and do the screen share and not be a total fool at it again. Um, so this time we're gonna talk about this one and Andrea and Steve, I want you to chime in. Well, Andrea, I want you to chime in on this one. Andrea, have you started this yet? I finished it. I, oh, okay, like... you did finish it, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, I just want everybody to do me a favor. If you, if you buy one book today, or if you pre-order one book, let's say, let's, let me just say if you pre-order one book, just pre-order this book. It's coming out, I think in November, just go ahead and hit the pre-order button and it'll show up on your door and you will thank me in November when that happens. Um, it was the most different. Tell me if I'm wrong on some of this stuff, Andrea. It was the most different, brilliant book I've read in a long time. Yes, it's quite amazing. Yeah. Um, and it's, I couldn't put it down. I, I don't. You know, I have other things to read as we were talking about before, but um, I just could not put it down. And um, it had me from the opening pages to the very last sentence. Yep, it, it does. And it's, it's so when you first start reading it, you're just reading about these characters. So you're kind of like, but so for, if you're going to get this, I mean, in November, you might forget this, but as you're reading it, remember those characters as you're reading about them in the beginning, because it comes into this thing. So it is, it's got, and it's, uh, we were talking early in the green room, the way that they describe it, it's a, a fiction thriller technology. Mm, throw that all away because I just don't like those descriptions of it. Yes, it has that in it, but it's so much more than that. It is got, it's a philosophical, it's, 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 I just can't even just, I will ruin it by trying to describe it. Just trust me, order it, read it. You're going to love it. So. Oh that. yeah. I mean, the character development, like each chapter is told from the point of view of um, a different character that they, come back into the story later right. so you have to kind of remember yeah, yeah. um and there's an, an anomaly that happens that yeah. um it is it's just brilliant it, yeah and it's very well done um it's speculative fiction but also literary and commercial fiction correct how does that how does how he does do how it? did he how did he do it how did he and it is in translation it, go ahead tom is this is this the book we that you were talking about last week comparing yes, it to yeah. a wrinkle in time? Yes, because I got yeah. because I got that blurb right. notice when we were off, and I was like, one of my blurb partners right. was like, "Oh my god, you all have to read this," and it was just well, like, yeah. It sort okay. of reminds me of, I mean, wrinkle in time for sure, right for adults, but um, also um, the time traveler's daughter meets um, 
what was that show? And it was a movie about uh, the people who disappear all over oh, the world. Lost? No. Lost. Um, they disappear. Oh, uh, the left. The leftovers. The leftovers. Oh, yeah. right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's sort of like that. Yeah. It uh, was. Yeah. It's just. It's brilliant. It's just yeah. a work of brilliance. So um, cannot talk about it enough. Okay, Gabe, I'll quit boring you, and you can go and do your. <laughs> He's like, they're not talking about my book. <laughs> <laughs> Gabe, finish us off with your with your last pick. Oh, you're still on mute. You're on mute still, my friend. Should we keep talking about the anomaly? Yeah, we should do it. No, he's <laughs> oh, gonna yeah, get there we go. Wait, Gabe's gonna get mad at us. <laughs> At least I couldn't hear you make fun of me or anything. So that was that was I'm curious to read the anomaly now. Yeah. How could I not? I I'm a sucker for these things, man. My list just gets I should put everybody on mute so I don't have to listen to these pictures because now I'm like, oh, I gotta get that book now. <laughs> literally, you'll read it in a, you'll read it in less than a day. It's like a literally like a four hour. It's just it's so Hervé, it's French. Yeah, Hervé. Something. So my book is not French. My book is International Polar Expeditions. Uh, you know, in the 1920s, the dirigible Zeppelins, blimps were uh, fast becoming a mode of transportation. They were big, giant luxury liners that ferried people across the oceans. They went, uh, they were faster than ships, you know, they uh, could travel farther than airplanes. And they, you know, were doing transcontinental flights back in the 20s and 30s. Um, so one of them was the uh, Airship Italia, which was this very luxurious um, travel blimp. And uh, at some point got commandeered by a group of explorers, Umberto Nobile, who was a designer and uh, of the actual airship and in charge of the airline. Um, and uh, Roald Admanson, one of the, the original uh, uh, Antarctic, uh, Arctic, Antarctic explorer. Uh, got, they got involved together and they were going to do this trip to the North Pole. They fell out and Nobile himself and his dog and a crew of 11 uh, decided to you know, do the expedition without Edmondson and they uh, took out to the North Pole and somewhere near the pole, the, the airship crashed. So um, luckily there was this convention gathering of famous explorers in Norway celebrating the first Alaska to Europe uh, blimp ride uh, or Zeppelin crossing. Um, so they were celebrating that in uh, Oslo at the time. So there was all these famous people used to traveling in these horrible conditions, ready to go. And Edmondson himself took off on his own, disappeared, was never heard from again. And um, and then, the, you know, the the all the imaginations behind as everybody's gathering supplies, equipment, uh, and you know, getting out to find these people, some surviving on ice flows. Uh, it's really kind of a it's a really cool story. So uh, Mark Piesing, I think, did a really good job. <clears throat> a lot of details that have never been uncovered before. He really got in there, did the research, uh, got into the nitty gritty of it all, and just creates a page turner. Um, I'd never heard of this. Uh, tragedy, this uh, disaster, air disaster. Uh, but uh, it's just sort of this, the era, you know, is the area, the 20th century era of exploration. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of good stuff there, good history, good adventure, uh, page turner, a lot of fun. Good for the beach, good for the, you know, your dad. I think it'll, ha it'll have a big uh, uh, broad audience to, to find because it's just, just a really good story. No, and we've done really well with a lot of those Amundsen books and the exploration books and the Arctic. So Shackleton and all those, that seems to do really well at Warwick. So I think this one's going to do really well too because it sounds yeah. Yeah, fascinating. And it's always fun just to say the word dirigible. Dirigible. It's just one of those words. <laughs> I used to be a blimp say. guy, but no, no, longer. no, no longer a blimp guy. No, I'm a dirigible man. <laughs> dirigible. I love it. Tom, we have a question for you from the audience from Arlene. Is the heart principle yeah. standalone or do you, do you have to read the other ones? You don't have to read the other ones. Okay. Definitely not. Um, but, it, but if you do, if you have read the other ones, then I think there's, you know, 
references you'll get, characters you'll see for this, you know, again, but standalone. It's standalone. Perfect. Okay. So you can read it. And then you could read the other ones too if you like some of the characters. Exactly. If you enjoy yeah. this one, then go back and read the other ones. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. All right. Uh, Steve, what is your lightning round? Okay. My lightning round pick is a new novel comes out tomorrow. Several people are typing. Okay. I think I'm pronouncing that almost correctly. And it's uh, just a really fun, um, you know, it's kind of like, if you remember the movie Office Space, it's Office Space meets the Hal story from 2001. And what it is, is it, it, it's this uh, PR company and everybody is communicates on Slack, which I'd never even heard of, but it's basically a space uh, uh, online space where you can email each other, you can have private conversations, you can have group meetings, all this stuff. So through, as the novel progresses, everybody's personal stories comes out on Slack. But one of the guys, his he actually, his consciousness gets stuck in Slack. And he, he his body, he can't get back into his body. And his, he has a friend go over to check on him and take care of his body while he's, he's getting a lot of work done now, now that he's only on Slack. And then there's this twist where Slack takes over his body and comes into the office, in the real office, and starts hanging out. Anyway, it's really, it's a, it's a lot of fun, original ideas, and uh, that several, several people are typing by Calvin Kosoki comes out tomorrow. Tomorrow, hardcover? Yeah, hardcover, yeah. Okay, I think I need to get that for my daughter. That sounds, that sounds like a cautionary tale. I love yeah. that. Well, well, look out, everyone. <laughs> Never really liked that one. I, I got it. I got the galley by the bed ready to go into it. Looks like a lot of, sounds like a lot of fun. Deborah liked it too? She loved it, seven people typing. Okay, all right, I've got to, I've got to get that one for my daughter, I think. Sounds like it's a good one for her. Because they're on, because they use Slack, because she works for Snapchat, so they use Slack all the time. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> like Great. you said, cautionary tale, maybe. Yeah. All right. Andrea, what's your lightning round? Got a kid's title, um, and this is Numbers Activity Book. This is from Button Books, one of our um, great... Uh, um, books from across the ocean or one of our publishers from, from across the ocean button books um and this is 12.99 and it's a paperback it's got um hours of number activity fun basically including mazes dots to dots coloring some spot the difference puzzles word searches uh you know drawing um exercises and over 100 stickers that you can use in tandem with the book or you know outside on you know just you can put stuff on put stickers on you know your you know your your mother's uh favorite gucci purse or something like that here's yourself a fun but uh yeah that would go over well <laughs> yeah but oh telling time i mean this is very key um and um it's just a great it's loaded with a bunch of stuff to do and um this stuff this stuff doesn't go out of style but um it's it's very entertaining i love the pages so um yeah. so numbers activity book love it and amanda saying on here love the old school art i love the activity books love those yeah the old school art yeah um the author um alain gray is um a uh, a Frenchman who's been who did this for years, basically, and Button Books has kept his um, his art alive and just sort of refreshed as needed. But I do I do think that the old school art will appeal to grandmas who are you know looking for books for their kids for their grandkids. Yeah. Um, and uh, there this came out earlier this month, so there and there's uh, copies in the kids sections at Warwick's today. Fantastic. Love it. I love me some dot to dot. Um, anyways, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> dot to dot my favorite thing. Just a little bit of personality. Anyways, okay, Tom, <laughs> close us out. <laughs> All right. So I have the easiest oh. lightning round of, of my summer. Paula Hawkins, a slow fire burning on sale tomorrow. So I don't need to tell you who Paula Hawkins is, but she's the author of Girl on the Train. 
and into the water. This is a return to form for her, I would say. Um, if you love Girl on the Train, you will love the new book. Um, young man murdered on a houseboat in London. There are three women whose lives intersected with him in various ways just before the murder. Um, and we, and as always, we see, you know, see, see the situation through each of these characters' eyes. And she has a way of, uh, it's always dealing with characters that are lonely, that are uh, forgotten, and they all have a reason to be involved in this particular uh, death. Classic Paula Hawkins. Um, She'll be on Good Morning America tomorrow, NPR's Morning Edition, talking about the book also tomorrow. Um, it's just, what, what else do you need to know? It's her next number one bestseller. Um, Lee Child says, a slow fire burning twists and turns like a great thriller should, but it's also deep, intelligent, and intensely human. Hawkins is proving herself a worthy 21st century heir to Barbara Vine and Patricia Highsmith. Um, and there are signed copies uh, at Warwick. So Perfect. get your signed copy at Warwick's tomorrow. Love it. Love a new Paul Hawkins. I mean, people are talking about like, yeah. I loved Into the Water. A lot of people were like, eh, I they liked do? it. I, know. I, I liked it. A lot of people thought it was too far away from what Girl on the Train was, but whatever. I liked it. Right. I like her book. Right. So. I mean, she's a real, I mean, she's a real, she's a real writer. So yeah, she's a good storyteller. book is going to be a little bit different. Yeah. yeah. She's a good storyteller. Okay. I'm just going to leave it one more time, Andrea, with because you did finish it and I just don't, I have to talk about it one more time, the anomaly, that ending, right? Ah! Yeah. Oh, yes. Brilliant. Okay. And, yes. and, the, and you know what else was in this is humor. The humor was so subtle, but so I haven't laughed out loud. I mean, honest to God, everybody get that book, read it. Okay. We have to end Julie so I can pre-order the anomaly. I, think I know. That's all I can do <laughs> just is- Exactly. I'll be beating people over the head till November about this. Book. No, it's really, it really is some, quite something. So. It really is. All right. We went a little bit longer. We talked about some other things today. Sorry to keep everybody for so long, but um, thank you guys and happy reading this week. And we'll see you next Monday at four o'clock. Ciao. Bye. Thank you.